Bernie Sanders is the ideological thought leader of the Democratic Party. He is the wise man upon the mountain who sits there conveying his genius to the rest of the American public. And he was, yeah, he, he's stupid. Um, but Bernie Sanders, I, I run out of accolades for Bernie Sanders. He was on CBS this morning discussing why America is fundamentally immoral and wrong. And this links up with the Andrew Cuomo perspective that America is inherently bad. What, may, what would make America better is if America were no longer America. If America were to embrace all of these other programs and policies that America has historically not embraced because we believe in individual liberty over collective redistribution. Right, that's the basic idea. So Bernie Sanders is on with CBS this morning and he explains why America is fundamentally immoral, it's fundamentally immoral, and it is fundamentally wrong, and I would like my pudding cup please before I keel over. My blood sugar is simply too low. I cannot handle this any longer. Please play the clip. I think that there is growing resentment, not only among young people, who in many cases are gonna have a lower standard of living than their parents. I think that there is an understanding there is something fundamentally immoral and wrong about a nation in which we have three people who own more wealth than the bottom half of the American people. That does not make sense. One of the things that you have to love about Bernie Sanders is that his take on economics is so disconnected from the reality of, of economics. The only thing I can think to analogize it to is the use of his hands to what he's saying. And they're, they're, they're completely disconnected. And he's just saying, he's sitting there and he's talking to you and you don't know what he is doing with his hands, but it just seems like at the end he's going to be doing the Macarena. No one understands why. No one understands why. But what's really great about Bernie is what Bernie does is he says, there are problems in life and these problems are bad problems. And that means socialism. So, so, okay, there are three rich people and a lot of poor people. Unless you can show me that the rich people stole from the poor people, I don't know what Bernie Sanders' problem is. Bernie, I don't begrudge Bernie Sanders his lake house other than I paid for it because I'm a taxpayer. But if he had actually worked in private industry and bought a lake house, then I certainly don't begrudge him his lake house. Bernie Sanders' entire priority is pointing out inequalities that are endemic to the human condition. Right? Every society has inequality. The question is not the inequality. The question is, how are poor people in the United States living? And the answer is poor people in the United States live better than poor people at any time in any place in human history, and it's not particularly close. And that is not to say, that's not to say that we can't have community programs that are designed to help poor people. It doesn't mean that there isn't endemic corruption to the American government that benefits some at the expense of others. What it does mean is that for him to sit there and suggest that income inequality is indicative of America being immoral is to ignore all of human history as well as any context. And that's a serious problem for, for, for Bernie Sanders in this entire perspective. Now, the good news for Bernie Sanders is the media will never ask him about any of this. And I, I want to show you the evidence of this. So CBS is Biana Galadraga. Uh, she was interviewing Bernie, and they reached the end of the interview. And he's gone through, you know, 15 minutes of interview. And when they reach the end of the interview, she finally says, she's, she's about to ask him how he's going to pay for any of this. And then, shockingly, they run out of time. I just, it's unbelievable. They just run out. It's amazing. Watch. Of course, the response from many is we like the ideas. How do we pay for them? This conversation, of course, will continue, but we've run out of time, Senator. Thank oh, you for joining Oh, what a pity. Us. Oh, what a pity. Now, it's funny how the conversation always runs out of time at just that point in the conversation. Right? Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, listen, when I offered to either debate her or have her on the show, I wasn't doing so. I wasn't doing so because I am just in love with the idea of spending time with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. I'm doing so because I would like for someone to actually ask her a series of questions about how she intends to pay for things. Because what happens is she goes on left shows and the media and they say things like, well, how are you gonna pay for that? And she says, well, the Republicans never pay for anything. And it's like, well, that's kind of true, but how are you going to pay for, I don't know, the quadrupling of federal spending that you are now proposing? And then they run out of time. And it's highly, highly irritating, but that's the good news for Democrats. All they have to do is go out and complain about how the world is, and then they can pose solutions that have no relation to reality. By the way, this is a terrible recipe for life. Just for every individual in the audience, leading a successful life is about recognizing the realities of the world and then dealing with those realities as they are. The people who have the hardest time in life, whether it's in relationships or whether it is in economics, those people are people who refuse to recognize the realities on the ground. Instead, they rebel against the realities. It shouldn't be this way. It shouldn't be this way. Well, there are certain things that shouldn't be because it's an act of oppression. Right? The American Revolution happened because there were certain things that shouldn't be this way and that we could change. But there are a lot of things about how human beings operate that are not changeable. 
Right? The fact is that there are certain people who are going to be smarter than others. As I know well, there are certain people who are going to be taller than others. Right? There, are lots of, there are lots of discrepancies and disparities in life. Accepting those discrepancies and disparities and then trying to deal with those, not on a collective level, but by working within the rules, is the way you have a successful society. Complaining and yelling at the moon is the way you have an unsuccessful society and a society in which we tear each other apart and tear each other down. But that is, I think, what... But that, I think, is what so many Democrats and members of the media want at this point, is to separate us and tear us down, which, is, which brings us to the second prong of the Democratic program. And that second prong is, of course, the race issue. Right? So we've already heard that their first prong is a bunch of free crap, and they won't say how to pay for it, and America's terrible. That's prong number one. And then there is prong number two. And prong number two is everybody I disagree with is a racist. Now, the best example that I could find today, this is really an astonishing example. So if you followed the news at all today, what you saw was that John Brennan, who's the former CIA director, under Barack Obama had his security clearance revoked by President Trump. And frankly, I think rightly so. I don't even understand the policy where your security clearance operates beyond your actual working for the government. It doesn't make any sense to me. If you want to contract with the government, for anybody, right? this is not a partisan issue, it seems to me weird they are out of government, but somebody can come spill classified secrets to you, and it's totally OK because you still have your security clearance. With Brennan, it's a particular issue because Brennan is a, an extraordinarily politically active Democrat. He was, even when he was at the CIA, Kimberly Strassel over at the Wall Street Journal had a piece back in July in which she detailed exactly how it was that Brennan was basically feeding information to Harry Reid in order to have Harry Reid come out and suggest that there was Russian collusion between Russia and, and then-candidate Donald Trump. Strassel talked about that at the time. So revoking Brennan's security clearance seems to me like kind of a no-brainer, honestly. And the, and the White House explained why exactly they did it. They said, Mr. Brennan's lying and recent conduct characterized by increasingly frenzied commentary is wholly inconsistent with access to the nation's most closely held secrets and facilitates the aim of our adversaries, which is to sow division and chaos. Now, it seems to me what they really should just say is that Brennan doesn't work with the government anymore. He doesn't need a security clearance. It's a little bit weird to have this particular president talking about like frenzied commentary and eccentric conduct and behavior as a rationale for not seeing secret information. I mean, it, he's the president, he's elected, Brennan is not elected, so he has the ability to say that, fine. But, the part of this that's really weird is what the Democrats actually had to say about this, what the left is saying about this. Because what, what you're about to hear is that there are people on the left who believe that the Brennan thing has to do with racism. <laughs> Brennan, if you hadn't noticed, is not a person of color. Right? Brennan is whiter than the backside of this piece of paper. So what is so racist about the firing or the, the removal of security clearance from John Brennan? No one knows, but the Huffington Post knows. So. <laughs> This is what the Huffington Post says. So it wasn't just John Brennan. The White House is now talking about removing security clearances from a lot of people. A lot of people. They're talking about removing it from James Clapper and James Comey, who doesn't even have a security clearance anymore. Uh, Michael Hayden, who doesn't have a security clearance anymore. Uh, Sally Yates, Susan Rice, Andrew McCabe, Peter Strzok, Lisa Page, and Bruce Orr. All those people they want to remove security clearances from. Sounds fine to me. Now, is it good politics to remove it from people who criticize you? It's not smart politics. But it would be good if we just had a blanket rule, again, that if you're not employed with the government, your security clearance goes away, and that's the end of the story. But here is how the Huffington Post plays this. And I kid you not, this is their lead headline over at the Huffington Post. Criticized for racism, Trump goes after black former national security advisor. Who are we talking about? Susan Rice. So I just named to you, let's see, we can count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten people. One of those people is black. They pick out the one person who's black he's talking about, and they say that the entire thing is racist. This is how far the left is willing to stretch in order to accuse the president of racism. This, of course, is why they are so overjoyed about Amarosa Manigault, who suddenly is earning a strange new respect from the left. Right? The lady that they called a liar and uh, whatever the female version of an Uncle Tom is, now she has earned strange new respect from the left. I, I mean that seriously. There's an article in the Chicago Tribune today. It's a column. It is by a woman named Dalene Glanton. And here is the column. Title, Omarosa may have earned back her black card. <laughs> See, but guys, guys, that's not racist. That's not racist to say she earned, that's not racist. It's racist to take, John, uh, to take away John Brennan's security clearance. That's racism. That's true, vicious, bull Connor racism. But saying that Omarosa Manigault just got back her black card because she criticized Trump, that's not racism at all. That's just, that's just spicy talk, right? So, <laughs> 
I mean, the reason I say that is because literally this was the argument that was made a, a week and a half ago about Sarah Zhang at, over at the New York Times. They said that that's just how people of color talk about white people, and you have to understand that's not racism. It's just how people talk, right? I mean, it's just kind of spicy talk that you use. In any case, here is the column. Come on, African Americans, have a heart. Amorosa Manigault Newman desperately wants her black card back. I think we ought to consider giving it to her. Look, I know we can't take this exclusive membership card awarded to every black person at birth for granted. It takes a lot to get it taken away, and it's only fitting that black people have to jump through a lot of hoops to get it back. Maybe Omarosa deserves a second chance. Omarosa's card was put in jeopardy when she sat shade onto the stage at a Donald Trump campaign rally in Ohio two years ago and criticized Barack Obama for trying to sell us hope. African Americans collectively snatched her card away when she took a job in Trump's White House. Is this a thing that, is this, like, is this how it works? I'm pretty sure not. I'm just, like, where, is there an actual card? Is there a crew of people who go to your house? Do they remove the card from you? Do they revoke it over the phone like a credit card? Does it go to a credit agency? Do you, if you're really good at being black, do you get like a black black card? Or like, or like a platinum black card if you're really extraordinary? According to this columnist, now that Amarosa is promoting a new tell-all book, she's practically on her news begging for black people's forgiveness, and she has come bearing gifts. Okay, so now that now she's criticizing Trump, this means she's legitimately black again, so this column concludes, she's given African Americans yet another example of what happens every time one of us tries to give Trump a chance. She has forced Trump to reveal on Twitter his doubt and right disdain for African American women. She has challenged black people not only to think smart, but act smart, especially in these troubled times, black card or not. Amarosa is still one of ours. She has nowhere else to go. Uh, okay, so, toler nothing but tolerance, nothing but tolerance from the left, but don't worry, they are out there fighting President Trump's vicious, brutal racism. I also appreciate that, that everything about Amarosa, like Trump criticizing Amarosa is now racist. When they were criticizing her as a sociopath and a liar five minutes ago, then it wasn't racist, but now Trump is a racist, so Seth Meyers, says that Trump is a racist with a rotted out soul. I mean, this is, this is real comedy styling from Seth Meyers right here. Late night comedians really just showing their comedic chops night in and night out. Here is Seth Meyers making you laugh with your mind, not with your mouth. We had our fun here, but in regards to this Omarosa business, let's not forget that anyone calls a black woman a dog is a racist with a rotted out soul. Okay, and that's when the clapter comes, right? It's not laughter, it's clapter. That's where the entire audience awkwardly claps, and then we say, oh, it's a new kind of comedy, a comedy without laughter. It's so deep, it's so great. Now, how Democrats hope to win with this message, that Trump is a racist, and by extension, everybody else is a racist. And they're, they're actually making that argument explicit, like Charles Blow over at the New York Times. He says that if the, if the, the aptly named Charles, Charles Blow at the New York Times, he says if the Trump N-word tape is real, Amoros has been going around peddling this idea that there is a tape of President Trump saying the N-word, so far, we have seen zero evidence of this. I'm extraordinarily skeptical of this claim because he's been president for a year and a half. He ran a highly contentious race. We got tape of him talking about grabbing women by the genitals. You figure if that one's out there, probably somebody would have paid for it by this point. But Charles Blow says if that tape surfaces, it would increase his support because everybody in this room, everybody on the right, secretly loves the N-word. Even though I've never used the N-word in my life and hate the N-word, and I've said openly that I think that if President Trump is caught using the N-word disparagingly on tape, it might be time for a primary challenge. Even people like me, I would actually be celebrating if the N-word tape is real, is what Charles Blow has to say. I think that if you found the tape of him using the N-word, it might actually increase his support among the people who support him. Okay. This, is, this does nothing to them. They are so baked in. They believe wholeheartedly in this approach that he is taking the castigation of an entire half of the country as racist, sexist, bigoted, and homophobic didn't work for Hillary Clinton, but they're going to double down on that, and then they're going to combine it with Bernie Sanders' socialism and hope that this somehow achieves electoral victory. Now, maybe it'll work, but only, only if the right is so toxic that it drives the middle away, because the fact is the left is so toxic, it is driving the middle away. It should be driving the middle away. Their program is to control. Their program is to condemn. Their program is to suggest that anyone who disagrees with them is somehow morally bankrupt.